Now, I wonder what one of your best stories is. I think everybody's got a good story, something that's happened in their life sometimes uh, when perhaps you've done something or got into a scrape and, and been rescued. I think I've shared a few times um, with you my dad's best story. I think I've shared this with you. My dad's best story is about the time he went uh, diving in the sea. Him and a buddy were with the diving club. I was on the beach with my mother and my sister while he went out in the boat. They went diving there a whale of a time, um, but the guy in the boat didn't really count the divers going in and out. And so uh, they left my dad and his buddy out at sea. And um, so there he was out to sea a few hours, um, him and his buddy kind of uh, swimming for their life. And as I, I think I must have been eight years old, um, I can still remember the day when my dad makes it back to the beach. And it's a bit of a kind of heroic story, isn't it? The day he got left in the sea. Um, and the day he made it. It's an amazing story. I love I love stories of people getting out of sticky situations. I, I don't know if you've got a story like that. Um, I think one of my greatest heroes when it comes to getting out of sticky uh, situations is Bear Grylls. I'm always getting my boys to watch Bear Grylls or to read Bear Grylls books. I take them to, to look at Bear Grylls and, and he does these TV programs where he'll go to the middle of nowhere up a mountain or in the snow or in the jungle or um, you know wherever he'll get into a sticky situation and he'll get out he'll inevitably involve him drinking his own urine uh, but whatever he does he always gets out and I love those kind of amazing stories. Well, tonight we're going to look at a psalm that comes off the back of an amazing story. And I think it's a story that David loved to tell. So we're going to turn to 1 Samuel and chapter 21, just to find out the story. Um, 1 Samuel 21. And uh, you'll remember that David uh, was a young kind of, you know, shepherd boy. And now he's been thrust into the limelight by beating Goliath. Uh, he is the giant slayer. He is the victor of the Israelites. Um, and so, you know, he's the kind of pinup boy. Uh, his Instagram has got millions of followers. Everybody's kind of, you know, signed up to his YouTube vlog. He is an amazing hero. And then this happens. It happens in 1 Samuel 21, and I'll begin reading at verse 10. That day, David fled from Saul and went to Archish, king of Gath. But the servants of Archish said to him, isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Archish, king of Gath. So he feigned insanity in their presence. And while he was in his hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the door of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Archish said to the servants, look at this man, he's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? David must have loved telling this story late at night, sitting around a campfire in the desert. Hey, boys, let me tell you about the time I really got into a scrape. And you know how much of a scrape it is, because do you remember um, when, uh, you know, we all meet uh, Goliath, you know, we all have done it and taught it in Sunday school um, and we all remember that the key fact about Goliath that we need to remember is 1 Samuel 17 1 Samuel 17 verse 4 a champion named Goliath who was from Gath came out of the Philistine camp basically David has ended up in Goliath's hometown there's still statues up to Goliath there's still posters up everybody still talks about him and here is the man who killed him. To give a kind of contemporary kind of illustration of this, this is akin to Vladimir Zelensky ending up in Moscow, right in front of Putin. That's what's going on here. I mean, David is in a scrape. And the word he's going to use to describe it in um, Psalm 34 is fear. But... He got out of it. He feigned madness. He basically put a pair of pants on his head, two pencils up his nose and said wibble. And uh, if you don't know what that cultural reference is, I'm sure you can look it up uh, some other time. He just got out of it. And it's a great way of getting out. Now, I think we've all got stories where we've been in a situation where we were scared stiff in our fears, our greatest fears, perhaps. And we got out of it. And perhaps today we're in a situation where actually we're in a situation of fear again. Some of us are in a season of fear. I think 
at the moment, I think there's five um, kind of key fears we could be facing. I think most of us on this Zoom call tonight will be facing one or more of these fears at the moment. So there's the pandemic. It hasn't gone just because the government are going to change the rules on the 28th of March doesn't mean it's gone. And some of us are still fearful because of the pandemic. There's Putin in the Ukraine. Many of us are fearful about that. Will this spill over into other nations? Will this become something greater? There's pain and illness. Whether there's a pandemic or Putin, we all know that season where we find a lump or we're waiting for a result. There's problem relationships. We're wondering with perhaps a relative or a loved one or even a work colleague, um, is this relationship going to make it or is it going to break down? What's the consequence going to be? Or I think today there's a fifth and that's price rises. There's price hikes. This morning I had to fill up my car to go to Cardiff. It cost me the same amount to put in half a tank this morning as it was to nearly fill it only a year or so ago. I mean, it's just crazy, isn't it? There's fears all around us all the time, but it does seem at the moment that there is a particular kind of overabundance of fears out there. So the question is, how do we get through this time of fear? How do we, like David, get out of it? How do we have a story to tell? Well, Psalm 34 gives us a fascinating insight into David's escape. Um, it's going to show us how we can have a similar story but perhaps the way he tells it is quite unexpected from 1 Samuel. I think when you actually look at Psalm 34, it doesn't sound like 1 Samuel at all, even though he gives it away at the start. So let me read for you Psalm 34. <clears throat> psalm 34, and we'll read the whole um, psalm. It's a psalm of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. This is what he says. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Or oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weary and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days... Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him, him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Did you notice something? David didn't think he'd saved himself at all. David isn't the hero of his story. God's the hero of his story. Do you know, one of the big keys to living life as a Christian is to realise that God is always the hero of the story. We never are. That when we find ourselves in fear, it's not about us finding our way out. Even though God uses means, it's all about trusting in God. So in verse 4, he's able to say, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And verse 6, this man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. You see, if you've heard my story about my dad before, you know I missed out the key part of the story, didn't I? If you've heard me tell the story before, my dad was stuck out to sea. The boat had left him and his buddy, and he did make it back on the beach. But the reason he made it back on the beach was because 
Well, it's because the sea rescue helicopter went out and got him. There was a helicopter overhead and a winchman got out into the sea, latched onto my dad and pulled him up into the helicopter. See, when my dad tells the story, it's the helicopter that's the hero. It's the ones who came to save him. And the big thing for us as Christians is to be able to remember that actually God is the hero. When we find ourselves in fear, the answer to our fear is not ourselves. It's God. I guess it's always a good question to ask, isn't it? Who is the hero of our story? Who do we expect to come and save the day? Who is the one who rescues us from all our fears? And I th I think as we look at this psalm tonight, kind of at the start of our Passion for Life mission, I thought it might be good to think about this psalm and to realise that this psalm is important to us because we need to see that Jesus is the hero of our stories. He deals with all our fears. But as well, what we're going to see in this psalm is that actually we need to tell others that Jesus is the hero of our stories and that we can invite them to a better fear. I'll unpack that in a bit, but we can invite them to a better um, fear. You see, I wonder sometimes if I don't share my faith because I forget that Jesus is the hero of my life. I think sometimes I don't realise how desperate I was and I forget how much he's done for me. And because of that, <clears throat> I don't share it. And perhaps I look at people and I forget that they need Jesus, that they need a true hero, that they need saving. See, Psalm 34 is actually a personal testimony. I think it's a masterclass in sharing your faith. Now, if you know anything about uh, Psalms and you've done your homework, um, you will know that uh, Psalm 34 is an acrostic. Um, we've come across acrostic Psalms before, which basically means each um, kind of sentence, the first letter of the sentence starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I'll be honest, I can't read Hebrew, so I'm trusting uh, the commentators on that, but they all seem to agree that is the case, which means it's a beautifully crafted poem, really well thought through. Now, the flip side to an acrostic psalm, uh, when all of the sentences are following um, the alphabet, is that it's very difficult to split up into a three-point alliterated sermon, because whilst it does have a kind of flow, it tends to meander a little bit for the sake of the acrostic. So uh, tonight I haven't got three points, um, uh, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, but the psalm, I think, does split into two general sections, um, two, two halves, which I think help us to remind ourselves that Jesus is the hero and to see how we can share that. So here's the first half. Let's look at the, um, the first point. I think the first point is testimony, where David is telling us to praise in the face of fear to praise in the face of fear because this is his story even in the face of fear he could praise God and I love the way in verses one to three he sets his agenda he's basically saying I'm going to extol the Lord at all times which I love he says I'm going to bless the Lord and glory in him there is that word I I but then in verse three then or verse to the second half he says but let the afflicted hear and rejoice glorify the lord with me let us exalt his name together see the wonderful thing about being saved is the wonderful thing about seeing jesus is you want other people to be saved you want other people to see jesus and so we have this kind of overflow of of excitement i see it on facebook i don't know if you noticed this um a kind of um the, um, the tradition at the moment, um, or the thing of the day at the moment, is when it comes to people's birthdays, very often they're on Facebook. They'll say, look, I don't want anything for my birthday, but here's a charity you can support. And generally, it's because the charity has done something significant in their life. So people who have been saved off mountains, they want people to give to Mountain Rescue. Um, people, perhaps, who have battled and gone through cancer, um, they want you know, the money to go to Cancer Research or Macmillan or, or something like that. Often what we do is when something has helped us or saved us in one way or another, we want others to give towards that, to see that. And that's what he's saying here. And so he's saying, look, come and bless the Lord with me. Come on. This is great. He's going to give testimony. He's going to share his experience. He's going to worship. 
but he wants others to join him. And he reminds them of the reasons for it in verses four to seven. He says, look, I sought the Lord and he answered me, verse four. He delivered me from all my fears. I mean, being in Gath, right in the place where everybody's singing about the fact that he's killed so many of their people. I mean, he's right in the middle of his fears. He was getting away from Saul. He definitely went from the, the frying pan into the fire. I mean, he had to face all of his fears. And he says, but look, I pray to God. I called out to God, um, verse four. I sought him and he delivered me. And then he goes and says more. God didn't just deliver him. Verse five, he says, and my face was radiant. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Can you imagine if you were in a situation where you had to feign insanity? Here's David, the hero of all, talking rubbish, letting saliva go down his beard. That's what the text says. I and mean, if ever there was a humiliating experience, that is it. Yet, in what was happening, he feels no shame and his face is radiant. So let's go back to the people who have been saved in one way or another from some situation. I always love watching video clips um, of people who have been rescued. Um, you know, we all love to watch different things on YouTube. Or if I go on the BBC News app, um, when someone's been rescued and there's a video of it, I'll always watch it. Because have you ever seen when someone, you know, they've been rescued from a cave after 34 days or whatever it is, you know, or someone's been, you know, on a mountain for two days and they've been rescued. Inevitably, the camera comes past their face. And even though they may be in pain, even though they may be in, on death's door, do you know what? Their faces are glowing. Have you ever seen the face of someone? I'm sure some of you in your kind of professional backgrounds have seen people, you know, they can't breathe, they think they're about to die, and then they give them some kind of medication or some kind of intervention. <gasps> Suddenly they can breathe. Suddenly they realise there's someone in the room who knows what to do, and their faces glow. Um, you know, perhaps some of us, like me, were watching the terrible news over the last couple of years. We've been watching about these poor people whose lives were ruined. Um, by a computer error in the post office. People who would never have stolen one pence, being accused of stealing tens of thousands, losing their businesses, going to jail, losing their families, losing loved ones. I mean, horrendous to know that people are just not telling the truth, know that you are telling the truth and no one believing you. I mean, if ever there's a horrendous situation, it must be that, that feeling of utter helplessness but you know when you saw the ones who were proven innocent on the steps of the court their faces were radiant they were glowing even though they faced so much my favorite one to watch if you want to ever make yourself cry if you ever fancy something to watch and make yourself cry um google and watch little children who have had their last radiation treatment They've had the all clear and they ring the bell on the way off the ward to say, I'm clear, I'm going home. Radiant faces on the kids, on their parents, on the staff, everybody. Because when you're saved, it changes you. David is saying, when we're saved, our faces are radiant. There's something about Christians that means their faces radiate grace now can i say we're not all smilers and um cornerstone we're definitely not all smilers some of us are frowners that's okay that's the way god has made you and if you did a handstand you would smile it's fine but you know god has made us different i'm not talking about fake smiles um you know the last thing you want in a passion for life um, meeting is a room full of people fake smiling <laughs> in kind of fake tan to kind of radiate um, that's not our style no no this this face that is glowing is deeper than a fake smile there's something about them and you know what it is you're with people and there's something about them 
and he says, do you know what? Not only does the Lord make his, make our face shine, he goes even further, and he says in verse 7, and the angel of the Lord encamps around them. The angel of the Lord encamps around them. It's an amazing picture. You know, you see um, in the Old Testament, don't you, you see the angels of, of the Lord come. And sometimes the view is given that you can see where the angels are. But the great news is for the believer that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear. And I think, um, as a lot of commentators say, that this is an Old Testament preview of the Lord Jesus. That actually, for us, it's the fact that the Lord Jesus encamps around. But more than that, for the Old Testament, looking forward... It was looking forward to that day when Jesus would encamp, the Lord Jesus would come down. You see, the amazing thing for us is God has rescued us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by coming into our world. And, and this is really huge. So it's not just that God has saved us, it's how God has saved us is so important. Remember, so just having a generic God who generically saves people say a God in heaven who is all powerful, who decides in his mercy on his birthday to click his fingers and to save you. Okay, well, that's, that's good. That's good, you know, lovely. But actually that isn't the gospel. The gospel is the God of heaven looked down, saw our misery, heard our cry, and decided, decided to send his only son. God himself came into our world, became one of us, lived our life. He lived all the fears that we face. I mean, we don't know much about 2,000 years ago, do we? But I am assuming 2,000 years ago that illnesses would have just flown through communities. They must have been like living in a constant pandemic, mustn't it? When there was no antibiotics when there was no anaesthetic, when there was no operations. I mean, how long did people live? We live in a, a relatively strange time in world history when so many of us lived for so long and so many of us faced diseases, illnesses and accidents that up until, what, 50, 60, 70 years ago, many of us would have died from. Jesus must have faced that similar experience to a pandemic. But what about Putin? What, what does Jesus know of that? Well, I'm sure Jesus knows far more than we know of Putin. I think he would know more of what the Ukrainians are going through now. Those who have to flee their own country. Because Jesus had to flee his own country. He had to go and be a refugee of sorts, seeking peace elsewhere. What about price rises? What about pain? He knew pain. What about personal problems? He knew what it was to have family members accuse him of being insane, closest friends betraying him for money. You see, our God, when he came to save us, became one of us. And then to save us, he wasn't like the winchman with my dad. You see, the winchman just came down and picked my dad out. In a sense, Jesus is like that. He comes down into earth. But yet he had the winch on. He had all of the kind of protective gear. He was nice and warm in his all-in-one and his wetsuit. He didn't know what it was like to be a drowning man, amazing as it is. But the Lord Jesus has faced everything we faced, and more than that, as the sinless one became sin, was accused of being a sinner, was, was named amongst the transgressors. It's horrendous when you think of that. If ever there was a reason to feel shame, to be the Holy One of all eternity, being accused of lying, being accused of all manner of things, and then representing the liar, the killer, the rapist, the thief, the paedophile, representing all of those people in himself. We have a wonderful saviour who does far more and has done far more than us for us than I than I think I could ever imagine or explain. He is amazing and he encamps around us. Jesus is, is with us. He is amazing. And so David here has this theme running through the psalm. 
And this theme running through the psalm is fear. It's fear. And, and, and fear changes throughout the psalm. So in the first half of the psalm, you've got the fear that he experienced in Gath. He's got the fears that we all experience in life. Verse four, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. But then, so in verse four, fears are something you need to be delivered from. But then in verse seven, where we are, he says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. So surely that fear is a good fear. So what's going on there? Well, the Bible does present two types of fear. There's two types of fear in the Bible. Um, I haven't got time to unpack it this evening. So if you want to, you want to read this. Rejoice and Tremble by Mike Reeves. Rejoice and Tremble by Mike Reeves. It's not a very long book, but it's a brilliant book um, on the theology of fear. But just to steal the book and to give it in a nutshell, Mike Reeves says that there's two types of fear in the Bible. The first is sinful fear, and the second is right fear. And really, sinful fear is a fear that drives us away from God. That's what sinful fear is. It's a fear that says, God can't help me, God won't help me, and I don't want God to help me. It's a sinful fear. Um, and really, those fears drive our life. So a fear, so there's natural fears, okay? There are natural fears. So if you see a snake that's, gonna, that's poisonous and you run away, that's okay. Um, because that's a natural fear. What we're talking about here is fears that run our lives, fears that direct us. So um, think about why you do what you do. A big reason why we do a lot of what we do is because of fears. There are fears that drive us. So, um, so why do people work hard? There's a lot of reasons why people work hard. Some people work hard because they fear what people will think of them. That's why they work hard. They want to be seen to be working hard. They want to have the title. They want to have the respect. And so that fear drives them. All of their decisions are about, I've got to work hard so that people will think well of me. Others are driven by a fear of poverty, driven by a fear of not being able to keep up with the Joneses. So the reason they work so hard is because they want the money, because they fear the opposite. So fears drive us. That's what, so it's not just talking here about a fear of a snake or, you know, um, a natural fear like that. This is, this is a driving fear in, in your life. So the sinful fear really is one um, whereby it drives you away from God. It drives you away from God. But there are fears which are right fears, which drive you to God. They drive you to God and so there's a sense in which we talk about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom and so the fear of the Lord there is the beginning of wisdom is a fear that drives us to him and it's a fear that when we come to him we're in awe of him because he is the answer and he's able to do something so even though we've we've kind of come to him there's still that but he is so much more it's magnificently represented in the Chronicles of Narnia um, with Aslan, isn't it? Um, a wonderful, wonderful lion, but yet frightful. And it's exactly the same with, with the Lord. So you think of the Lord Jesus in the New Testament, very, you know, well-known account. The disciples are in the boat, the storm comes, they have a, a kind of natural fear. It's okay to be scared in a storm. That's a natural thing question is what's it going to do what's it going to do so the disciples had a choice they had sinful fear or they had right fear sinful fear would have been just to keep on rowing keep on rowing try and maybe get a couple of them and chuck them overboard but a right fear was to wake up Jesus for the hardened fisherman to wake up the carpenter who was fast asleep and look that that faith was mixed with doubt wasn't it Faith. I mean, don't you care if we drown? It's a pretty severe accusation, isn't it? But yet the Lord gets up. He commands the winds and waves to be quiet, and they stop like a mill pond straight away. And what do they say? It says they were very afraid. And they said, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They knew he was going to do something, otherwise they wouldn't have woken him up. 
But even in knowing that, he was so much more than they expected, so much more. And really, that's a right fear of the Lord. The right fear of the Lord is when you know God can do something and you fly to him, but you're overwhelmed. You see, if I went out into the um, wild with Bear Grylls, I think I'd be a little bit in fear of him. What I mean is this. I wouldn't be scared of him because I thought he was going to do something terrible. I'd just be in awe of him because he can get out of any situation. And I'd be like, I'm with Bear Grylls. Might have to drink my own urine, but this is going to be brilliant because it's OK. I, I know what's going to happen. He's going to he's going to get us out. So there would be an affection and respect as well as a kind of fear of I'm not really with someone who's like me. Bear Grylls is quite different. How much more God? that when we're in tough situations, we cry out to him and, and he's able to save us. And so no wonder David is singing, no wonder he's encouraging others to sing with him, to praise, to extol, to glory, to glorify. It's because God is the one that beats all other fears. And you can come to him and even though he is magnificent and he encamps around us, he is good. And so he makes an amazing um, invitation. Verse 8, probably the most famous verse of the psalm. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. I think this is the ultimate evangelistic technique. Taste and see that the Lord is good. It's like the Abergavenny Food Festival, isn't it? What is the best thing about Abergavenny Food Festival? It's the free samples. I love the free samples. And if, if someone doesn't give away free samples, I won't buy from them. Now, it's not because I'm West Whalian and tight, but um, because why aren't you willing for me to taste first? Why aren't you willing? I always think the ones who know their food is amazing will let you taste it because they know that if you taste it, you will buy it. You will buy it. You've got to be pretty confident of your product if you're going to let people taste and see. And David says, having been saved, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see, the best, the best way for the church and the Christian to reach out is basically to have Christians who know they've been saved and love God for saving them and are able to say, come and see a man who knew everything about me. Or like Levi, let's have a party, invite Jesus. There's something about knowing that we've been saved a radiant face that means we're able to say, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's so important, isn't it, to know that we're not inviting people to a proposition, but we're inviting people to a living experience, to experience the living God. Taste and see that the Lord is God. Fear the Lord, verse 9, you holy people. For, for those who fear him, lack nothing and even young people verse 10 there's a nod there the lions may grow weak and hungry that generally means young people but those who seek the lord lack no good thing it's wonderful what the lord jesus can do now if you know your bible you know that we're coming up to a section now that's picked up in the new testament um quite quite heavily verses 12 to 16 they're picked up in 1 peter chapter 3 verse 8 to 22 and you know that is one of the most important evangelistic texts of the New Testament. Why should we always be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have? It's all based on Psalm 34. So I'm not making a flight to fancy kind of jump here. The New Testament takes Psalm 34 as the basis for evangelism. And the basis is this, is that Jesus has come and he has lived this psalm for us. You can look it up later on when you have, when you have more um, time to do it and so having invited them to taste and see the psalm kind of changes style I don't know if you noticed that the psalm changes style in verse 11 so you've got general psalm style and then verse 11 onwards actually it doesn't read like a psalm anymore it now reads like the book of proverbs that's what it reads like now come my children listen to me I will teach you to fear the Lord whoever of you loves life and desires many good things Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. It's very pro proverbs in, in style. 
And so if in the first half of the psalm we've got testimony that actually, um, you know, we can, we can rejoice in the face of fear, then in the second half we've got teaching, which is we can have proverbs in the face of fear. And this is uh, really important to see um, what he's teaching. I'm not going to spend so much time on this second half, but really he's unpacking healthy fear. He's unpacking right fear. He's telling them the whole thing. I think this is really helpful. David is sharing an amazing story. He's making sure they know he's not the hero of the story. Jesus is the hero of the story. But then he's not overselling it. He's not overselling it. So David does a little bit of a dance here, doesn't he? There's a little bit of a dance here. I think that's the right word. David did dance. So I think we're allowed to say it's a bit of a dance. So, so follow what he says. So verse uh, nine, you've taken refuge in him. And then he says, okay, so let me teach you what the Christian life is like. He says, well, if you do follow him, if you seek in verse 10, you lack no good thing. Or what about um, he goes on, you know, and, and repeatedly talks about kind of things like that. So verse 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord shows them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Now, is David starting to fall into health and wealth? What is going on with David here? Well, David is teaching in the way that the Bible does teach. In the, in the already, but not yet. This kind of, kind of in-between that the Bible presents um, repeatedly. And so he's talking about the fact that we will lack no good thing that we will um, be able to trust in the Lord and be delivered from all our troubles. Verse 11, he'll save those who are crushed in spirit. Verse 19, the Lord delivers him from them all. Uh, talks about bones, verse 20, saying not one of them will be broken. But actually, what is he talking about? He's talking about the ultimate end of the believer. Um, David is a man who knows the suffering that's going to come. You see, the key for, for David is that he knows that ultimately that is what is true. Ultimately, that is true. But more than that, he knows that he isn't just waiting for what's going to happen in heaven and what's ultimately going to be true. He knows what is true now. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. Verse 15, he says that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are attentive to their cry. For me, that's always my favourite part of Exodus, as we've been reading this month. My favourite part of Exodus is for the first three chapters, how often it repeats that God hears the people's cries, that God sees their misery, that God cares. You see, the one who encamps around us and in Christ has now come into our world and has experienced everything we experience, he is now in heaven and he sees us. So the one who sees us now is the one who knows what we're going through. That's huge, isn't it? You know what it's like when you're going through something and you meet someone who's been through the same thing. There's a sympathy and an empathy. There's a patience. There's a mercy. There's a grace that doesn't exist in other people sometimes. Unless someone has gone through what you're going through, sometimes they're not as, they're just not as sensitive as they could be. I, I think you know that. That's why I think lots of people get more and more pastorally sensitive as the years go by. Um, in their 20s, perhaps, they just think everybody should get through everything quite easily. Um, it's like parenting, isn't it? In my 20s, I preached loads on parenting. I'll get guest preachers in now. It's fine. <laughs> I've, lost, I've lost all kind of confidence and all my kind of, you know, easy three-point sermons on parenting and marriage and church leadership and all those things I preach in my 20s. Okay, I think I'll just get other people into preach now. Because there's something about the more you experience of life, the more you're merciful to others. Lord Jesus, he's experienced the worst of this world and more. And when we are in pain, his eyes are on us. His ears are attentive to our cry. Just like a child who's ill overnight, your ears are attentive to their cry. Are they crying? Is that them? Are they coughing? Are they okay? 
that is our God. That's why I think David's face is so radiant. That's why he's extolling him, and that's why he's calling others to do it too, because he knows how gracious and generous God is. And look at verse 18. I love verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Do you see how it's, it's moving in? So my face is radiant because there's God. Now God is encamped around me, and now God is close to me. And when is he close to me? He's close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are, listen to this phrase, crushed in spirit. Are you crushed in spirit? The Lord is close to you. Do you know that language there for the Lord is close is, is the language of next of kin. It's the language of family. That's why his face is radiant. That's why he's asking everybody else, come and worship him. Fear this Lord. Because this fear is a fear of a loving heavenly father who is close to us, who ultimately will save us. But even whilst we're waiting for that day, he is with us. You see, I think that's what makes Christian testimony so powerful. I think what makes Christian testimony so powerful is pain. Those are the best testimonies. It's Christians who have struggled. It's Christians who have suffered. It's Christians who have gone through life and are able to say, but the Lord was with me. But the Lord was with me. I um, read last night, and I'll, I'll finish on this. I read last night <clears throat> about um, an amazing minister, uh, the Reverend Job. The Reverend Job lived through the 1904 revival, and uh, I think he was born in Aberdeer. He was an absolute legend on the Welsh scene. He uh, won the crown and the chair in the ice Board multiple times. So he was kind of Welsh cultural royalty, an intellectual genius. Goes to be a minister in Bethesda up in North Wales. <clears throat> in his first kind of five years, I think, of ministry in Bethesda in North Wales, his firstborn child dies just after being born. His second child dies and uh, his wife was so ill whilst his um, second born child died that he had to bury the child whilst the mother was away. And then the third child died and then his wife died. I mean, it's just, here is the man who had it all. And then here's the man who lost everything by 1903. 1904, the revival sweeps through Bethesda. Phenomenal. Um, and he's one of the key leaders in it. Um, sees hundreds saved. It's an amazing story. But he's a man who knows pain. And I found interestingly, if I'm honest, reading his biography and reading about him, I found his life before 1904 far more interesting. And testimony to God's grace was God getting him through those days far more than getting him through a revival. Um, there's a, a diary extract where he's just buried one of his children. And he's just talking honestly and openly to God in his diary about the pain. And then he says this, but God, I trust one day you will reunite us. His hope in the goodness of God and in what God would do in eternity meant that having done all of that, he could still go on. Today, on the Welsh side, we still sing his hymns. He was an amazing hymn writer um, who spoke of, of the experience of God. And I do think the most powerful testimonies aren't the polished lives where everything has gone brilliantly, but it's the lives of those who have suffered, who have lost, but yet the Lord has kept them. And I think that is the testimony we need to share with people. Come and bless the Lord with me. Come and glorify the Lord with me. Let the afflicted, the suffering, the struggling, the downtrodden, those who are crushed in spirit and brokenhearted. Listen, here is a God who encamps around us and draws near to us in our moment of need.